podcast, Jenny Hesterman, ASISonline.org. And tell us what you do for the organization. Well, I've been with ASIS several years, and right now I'm on the School Safety and Security Council. Okay, good. Um, also, I'm in the Women in Security Council. Good. And uh, do a lot of moderating at the event and also speaking. And panels. former military. Former military, and take retired. Up your service. Thank you. I was Thank a police you. officer. I couldn't go in the military. I would have been court martial. <laughs> I just couldn't tell people that don't know what they're talking about to tell me what to do. I couldn't do it. So I have great admiration for people who can follow orders, right? Yes, I follow orders very well. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> now, we're going to talk about uh, a book you wrote, and yes. it was a book of the year in 2015, 15, right? Yes. And mm-hmm. we'll put it up here. This okay. was Thank you. about soft, tar- soft target hardening. Can you guys see that? Can we see that, Sean? Yep. All right, good. And this is a favorite topic of mine because. People underestimate the value in this. Yes. They think if I put in a whole bunch of fancy bells and whistles, I'm safe. But if it doesn't look hard, yes. you're still going to be attacked. Whereas if I put lights outside and spend no money, mm-hmm. I got a hard target and I don't even know it, right? Right. So tell me tell me what your philosophy is on this and, and where you came to specialize in this because schools certainly need to be a hard target. It's, it's a super soft target, right? Absolutely. Well, in the military, it's interesting because uh, my last job was the vice commander of Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland. Oh my so God, the home of awesome. Air Force One. Yeah. Um, and it's a hard target, obviously, and sure. a lot of security. Uh, but while I was the working security there, I realized that it was a hard target filled with soft targets. We had schools, we had housing areas, oh, dormitories filled with airmen, shopping areas. Um, and if the bad guys could somehow get through the gate, they were never going to get to the target of Air right. Force One, but they could get to a dormitory or a school, a church. So I started to think about soft targets, and then I lived in the Middle East for two years, and I lived um, out with the people, and I saw how they hardened their soft targets, like churches and schools. So this book kind of came to me okay. as sort of a compilation of what I learned in the military and then also living overseas in the Middle East. Um, so what I found is an over-reliance on technology and security. Um, in the military, we have a saying that the human's the best weapon system because humans have intuition. Yeah. Um, they connect dots. True. Um, they, they learn, uh, they have emotion, machines don't do that. Also with cyber, you know, you can have the best security in the world and someone unplugs it or hacks it and you're blind, right. basically. Um, so this book really focuses in on the human, the human as a sensor, um, also the human as a vulnerable target, because as Americans, we don't target schools and churches and, you know, we protect innocent civilians, right. whereas in warfare throughout the century, warfare has changed. And now 90% of the casualties in war are civilians. And 90% you, now? 90%. Wow, when did that shift? After uh, World well, II? after World War II, wow. and then now with technology, um, you know, we we can specifically target someone and not hit a school or right. a church. We don't do it on purpose. But if you look in Syria and other conflicts, though, children are targeted. Uh, yeah. Older people are targeted. Well, people don't understand that uh, about 80% of all terrorist attacks are not attacking a military or a government. It's personal property and people exactly. that are killed. Exactly. Exactly. It, that's it, mm-hmm. that's the plain truth. That's right. But, you know, the media, the way they put things up, not mm-hmm. intentionally, but the sensationalism makes it look like, oh, terrorists are going to attack our government and our military. No, they're going to go blow up somebody's house first. Well, that's exactly yeah. right, because they're soft targets, that's and then right. there's one on every corner. Exactly. So in my hardening work, it's difficult, because uh, really, when I work with the facility owners, I tell them, you're responsible for this building, so you need to look hard, and when the bad guy comes by and sizes you up, they think you're too hard to hit, and they go up the street to the next target. Right. It's sad, but, I mean, there's people working in the business of trying to dissuade sure. the person from attacking at all That's right. and identifying them. But for facility owners, really, you just need to look hard. And uh, one thing I've learned in the military is um, I, w- I was a tactical deception officer trained in the military. Oh, that's awesome. So we used to make things look like they really yeah, weren't uh, right. to the bad guys. And so with churches and schools, they don't have a lot of money. Right. So I like to help them look hard uh, without spending a lot of money. Now, so this is an interesting point. So does that also include reputation? Well, yes. It's part of your hard target. Absolutely. Which is something mm-hmm. you can do without any money or, or things, right? Well, that's right. Yeah. yeah I mean, they can appear hard, you know, in their um, press releases and what they say. Like, we do random yeah. bag checks. Um, we're putting up new fencing. You know, they can definitely communicate a hardening that way. Yeah. I mean, everybody in my block in Burbank knows everything goes to hell. You're going to come to my house first. <laughs> and don't come to my house and mess around because you're not going to leave my house <laughs> if it's something serious, right? Yes. And, yes. That, and that's just, and I did, that's not my reputation, by the way. Mm-hmm. That was all my kids growing up, and their friends like, hold on, Mr. Hurl, hold on, Mr. Hurl. <laughs> I scared them. I don't know what, it, you know, because I was an ex-policeman, right? But that created a reputation. Yes, yes. And that's super important. It is. It's very important. And, and people uh, say, you know what? I can go over here where they don't have that problem. And that's it. That's yeah. an issue. And with the for-profits like malls. So I worked a project in a major U.S. city, I won't say which one, okay. to uh, harden six of their malls against a terrorist attack. 
And it was very interesting working with them because they're for profit. They a lot of them don't want to look like a fortress. You know, they want to look yeah, inviting to the public. Yeah. They want the public to come in and shop there. But like I told them, um, there's a lot of malls. And so if you don't feel safe at a mall or you see that maybe the gangs are there and hanging yep. out on the weekends or whatever, you're just not going to shop there. So people want to see security now. And I've also found that people are sizing things up on their own. They're doing their own security assessments. Okay. Um, for instance, when I shopped for college with my daughter a couple years ago, I asked a lot of hard questions about security, of course. They don't like she that. was a little bit embarrassed, <laughs> too. Right. I, I asked thing. a lot of hard questions. Yeah. But, um, but there's 4,000 colleges in the U.S. That's right. There's a big selection. So if, if I didn't feel that she was going to be safe on a campus, then I'm going to vote with my checkbook and go somewhere else. So that's kind of where we are now. So I tell them um, people expect security. They want to see security and they want to feel safe. And so they could get out ahead of it now or they could wait till something happens and then their reputation right. is damaged um, and then people won't shop there anyway. Tell so, me some things that aren't costing a lot of money for people that they're not probably even thinking about that they could start right now listening to this show. Uh, one thing that I found with the malls is that they sort of felt like an island, you know, and, and we were... In the military, we never felt like our base was an island. We knew everybody on the perimeter. For instance, at Andrews Air Force Base, I knew the McDonald's manager. I knew the 7-Eleven okay. manager. Yeah. Because they're the eyes and ears outside the, the base. Right. So if somebody's taking pictures or they're um, doing surveillance, they're going to see it. I may not see it from my office. Uh, so I had the mall managers meet the people on the perimeter, the Best Buy the Applebee's manager, the apartment managers, and so that they kind of had a circles of protection around them so that it didn't just start at the front door. Um, also to incorporate the parking lot and consider that as part of the security because a lot of bad stuff starts out there and Absolutely, moves inside right. the building. So really just those circles of security and then just communicating with people who can help be eyes and ears for you on the outside. Um, also, what I learned in the Middle East is that uh, they would take old Jeeps and old trucks, for instance, and they'd repurpose them as security vehicles. They would just put some striping on it with right. reflective tape, make it look like a security vehicle, and just park it in different places. And that's a cheap solution. You yep. know, certainly for a church, somebody would donate their vehicle maybe to be used that way. Now, you have to move it around because if the bad guy's sizing right. you up, they might get onto you with what you're doing. Um, but those are just inexpensive ways to look hard. You know, when you're not really spending a lot of money. Did you find Lena Malls had a liaison with the police department? Because at Cover City PD, we had a great program with Fox Hills Mall, which was ripe with gangs and problems and all kinds of things. But yes, we were in there all the time on foot patrol just for fun. Right. And we had we knew the shop owners. They called us personally, you know, at the station and mm -hmm. let us know what's going on. And that was sure. very effective. Yes. Just to get again to develop a reputation that you know Cover City PD is here. Right. So don't yes. come. To, go to the next mall. Right. Right. Exactly. Yes. But, but sometimes you know business owners don't want to be associated with police and in this political climate nowadays. It's like, well, you know, mm -hmm. we don't want to be political, but. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? It's, it's uh, a way to do it, but are you finding malls resistant? Well, a little bit resistant because they don't want that presence again. You know, yeah. if people see a lot of police, they think there's a problem no, automatically. Don't, no, don't want people <laughs> think you're safe. Right? Well, that's what I'm trying to tell them. That yeah, now exactly. things have changed. Yeah. So, um, but what we did with uh, this in a certain city was we trained some law enforcement officers to do red teaming. And so they would oh. go in on their off-duty okay. time in civilian clothes, yeah. and they'd look for propped open back doors. They'd look for how long it took to leave a bag in the food court till something happened. They were probing a little bit. Now, the mall manager knew and the head of security knew what they were doing, but they did an assessment. And then we would give that to them confidentially. You know, there's one copy of this report because, of course, they don't want it to get out, you right. know, that they have problems. Uh, but using the local law enforcement that way, you know, as secret shoppers sort of yeah, in yeah. the security no, realm, that's, good. that's another way to harden um, in a way that, you know, people want their community to be safe so they'll do it for free. Now, yeah. are you on a council here with ASI? I am. Okay, mm -hmm. what, what council is that? I'm on the School Safety and Security Council. Oh, you mentioned, that's right. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. Short memory, sorry about that. <laughs> and are you speaking, doing lecturing, or can I they come lecturing. see you at the council booth or what? Well, I am lecturing tomorrow at 11 o'clock. I'm okay. doing a women in security um, discussion about um, what it's like to be a woman serving in a male-oriented career field right. and all the balancing and everything that we do. Um, That's not easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy in the police department for my colleagues, too. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was a dual military couple. My husband was military as well. Right. We had a daughter, so I did the whole juggling act. Um, and then on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday afternoon, I'm doing a bomb threat session. Oh, I'm co-presenting on that. And we're it's actually a unique uh, theory on how to respond to bomb threats because there's so many of them now, and they never turn out to really be a bomb. And so we're talking about what may be a more proper response response is okay. to all these bomb threats Excellent. and then the psychology of bomb threats as well see what you guys are missing by not coming to asi as 2017 in dallas but uh miss jenny hesterman has the answers for you guys in her book let's show that book one more time thank you 2015 book of the year Sarf soft target hardening can we see that excellent and we can get that at the uh, as online store i suppose you can and mm -hmm. here at the uh, at the conference it's here at too, the conference right? in the bookstore excellent mm -hmm. jenny thanks for coming thank on the you. show i appreciate it thank you fascinating appreciate conversation and thanks for the good work you're doing thank you tune in, in a few minutes for our next show here at asis 2017 dallas texas securityguytv.com live online from live stream we'll see you in a few minutes thanks <laughs>